thank you so much for making some time this morning to talk about Katya's piece Maxima, which is the 2022-2023 Arlene and Larry Dunn Composer in Residence Commission. Uh, I'm so excited to have everybody here and to be able to chat about this premiere a little bit. The premiere will be given on Sunday, March 26th in Finney Chapel on a 6.30 p.m. concert. Um, and it's uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with Katya um, toward the you know preparation of the of the piece and the completion of the piece and then i'm looking forward this coming sunday to coming to rehearsal and getting to hear a little bit of it uh as philharmonia works on it so um i want to start by posing well let's make some introductions first i'm colin holter i'm noyo's executive director antoine hi i'm dr antoine clark the director of philharmonia katya hi i'm katya Mueller. i'm a second year composer student here at oberlin college and conservatory Arlene Dunn and Larry Dunn. Um, so let me pose a couple of questions to Katya about the piece by way of a, a sort of um, introduction here. The name of the piece is Maxima, as we discussed, or as I, as I mentioned. Um, I want to know, before we get into the specifics of Maxima, a little bit about your background, Katya, as a composer. Um, what are your uh, kind of reference points? What are your goals? In a broad sense, um, you know, your... Uh, What's your journey been like as a composer? Could you say, speak a little bit about that, please? Sure. I actually didn't initially like classical music, but I always loved film music. And so I would, I mean, I would really want to move to the music. At the the credits after the movie, I would kind of dance around to whatever film soundtrack was going on there, because that's when they can really play a full clip um, without the interruptions of the actual movie. So I loved film music as a kid and I tried to sort of mimic it first on garage band like before middle school even um eventually I wanted more and more complex music and so I kind of came full circle back to classical music in that way which was really quite fun um to to discover it later I'm still catching up repertoire wise I feel like compared to my peers but I also kind of get to discover everything um from the perspective of someone who's like really fascinated by it as an older student. And I played a lot of music as a violinist um, in orchestra and as a percussionist in my concerts wind ensemble. My, yeah, my high school wind ensemble or concert band. Um, and I always had an affinity for the more film music sounding pieces. But I really, I loved it all. And especially in percussion, I could see the whole orchestra and I had a view, an aural sound view of everything going on. And it was a great perspective to have as a developing composer, as far as orchestration and just as far as, and as far as leading a rehearsal and learning the specifics of each instrument and learning their strengths and weaknesses and how they all function together in this large ensemble. And so I think because of those experiences, I do also focus mostly on large ensemble music when I can. Uh, could you speak in, in a little bit more specificity about this new piece, Maxima, and how does it emerge from your experiences that you've had before, and how does it reflect your predilections and your interests? Sure. So I came up with the arpeggios right at the beginning of the piece as the first thing. And I came up with them on my violin many, many years ago. And I was like, this is really cool. I can do a B flat major chord and then a B minor chord. And it's all really easy, um, but it sounds super cool. And um, I think during my gap year in Germany is when I came up with the melody for this. So the piece has been in my mind for a really long time on the back burner. And I received the commission for this piece. And I was like, this is the, this is a chance for me to use this stuff that's just been kind of stewing and I've never had a chance to put it onto paper. And so I did that and I made it, I think from the beginning, the piece wanted to be in that film music genre. Um, but then also for a junior ensemble, which meant that I was relying on my experiences in a youth orchestra and a youth wind ensemble. And I called it Maxima mostly because of the 
the initial local like shape of an arpeggio going up and down and that there's a high point. Um, but then also on a larger scale, there's this sort of narrative growth to the big finish. And then um, there are these, these ebbs and flows along the way that always are such that the new maxima is higher than the last and they're always redefining where that is from a standpoint of uh, um, the tension of the piece. So you're you're using the word maxima kind of in its algebraic sense. Is that yes. fair? Yeah, yeah. Do yeah, also like math. Yeah. Um, when I first uh, looked at the score, what I was struck by in the very beginning of the piece, which I think is, you know, we have a, a as listeners, uh, the sort of music cognition literature would tell us that primacy and recency are two really important um, things to keep in mind. In other words, the thing we hear first in the piece and the thing we hear last in the piece will be the parts of the piece that may sort of stay with us uh, the most strongly in the in the time after we've heard the piece. And the very beginning of that piece was really striking, I thought, because uh, we talked about this before, of its use of um, parsimonious voice leading and neo Riemannian transformations harmonically. Um, and I thought that was uh, as a really, really cool way to start the piece. And, and it's the, the sort of texture of it or the, um, the figuration of those arpeggios is like, it's really great. And, and I think that uh, I think it'll be really exciting to hear. Um, can I move to, to uh, Antoine for a moment um, and ask, what is it like to rehearse this piece with Philharmonia's musicians? I think you might be muted. Sorry about that. We've done an initial reading of the work um, and I think we've had now two rehearsals on, 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 on the piece. Um, and it's it's going very well. Um, the students have uh, had tremendous a tremendous response to the work, and that really just um, is a testament to Katya's writing um, and making this very accessible for the students. I like to think that you know there's challenge to the piece, but it's 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 within their wheelhouse, and they can um, they feel great that they're going to be able to. Uh, obtain uh, and and make this a, a work that will be great for our concert. So it's it's been fun rehearsing it and um, letting the students. Uh, you know, we when we read through it and I asked them how did they like it, and they were like, "Oh my gosh, this is great! This is quote from them the best piece that we've gotten to read." You know, in this in this uh, vein. So uh, I was very happy to see that. Um, but yes, it's been great working with the students on it and um, and um, figuring out how everything ties together. So a very good start. That's great to hear. I mean, I, I was always told that as a composer, your first audience is the performers, in a sense. So if this piece it goes over well with the performers, which it really seems to have, then that bodes well for the uh, for the entire process. I think. Um, let me pose a question to Arlene and Larry. So, Maxima is the sixth by my count, and maybe you'll be able to correct me on that if I've, if I've missed one, but I believe the sixth piece commissioned through the Arlene and Larry Dunn Composer in Residence program. And uh, this is like a growing sort of repertoire, a growing body of music that's come out of this project. Um, and there's a growing community of composers uh, who have been a part of it. So what I'd like to know from, from the two of you is how would you, uh, what would you hope to see from this repertoire as it continues to grow? I mean, what do you, um, what do you, um, what do you like for these pieces to to be? What lives do you like them to have, both in the moment of performance and then maybe even in the future also? Um, what's your sort of aspiration for uh, the body of music that this program is producing? Well, one of the things um, that uh, I always like to think about, um, about new pieces being, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, we follow a lot of um, ensembles that that um, play music of living composers. Um, we're excited to um, have these um, performed multiple times. And I don't know um, uh, how this um, program can can work towards having it performed uh, more times. Because it's written, you know, with this Noyo Philharmonia Orchestra in mind that they perform it, and then it just seems to be over. I don't know if other any other piece that 
has come out of this program has been performed a second time even. It may not have been. Yeah. So I don't know what, what we can, what could we do um, to help ensure that that, that happens? And, and, you know, and, and when I say we, I'm including, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. Larry and myself. Um, to, um, I don't know, I'm interested in hearing what ideas you, any of you might have about um, additional performances of pieces and how that can be done. Yeah. Well, I haven't um, actually thought about this question, so I really appreciate your <clears throat> thinking of it. Um, I have the same feeling as Arlene, of course, that getting these pieces played more than once would be great. <clears throat> um, you know, the a few things occur to me. One, uh, at some point, it might make sense for us to um, prepare a book of some sort that includes these scores, if the composers would agree to be included. And um, I know they've all been very excited about the piece when they created it, but you know, five years later, they might not be so excited. I don't know. Um, but that's one avenue that we could pursue in terms of making the scores available. Um, you know, recording is another possibility, although I don't know exactly who we would convene to record them all, um, although there may be a way to do that. Um, and Antoine might have some ideas about who might he might gather to do it. Um, the other thing I was thinking about was, uh, you know, I think, Katya, I don't know if you, can't remember if you heard about this when we, when we talked about it in your presence, but Jeff Scott um, is starting this new program of um, readings of uh, works that um, need to be heard. And a lot of it is focused on underrepresented composers and such. Um, he, he started this with a reading of his new piece for the Portland Youth Orchestra that is, I think, being premiered this month or maybe in April. Um, and he, he needed to hear what it sounded like as he was finalizing it for them. And he brought together this group to do it uh, in the, at the conservatory. Um, so that might be an opportunity also to see if Jeff would uh, assemble a group to read through these things, which might, uh, you know, provide more opportunity to get these works known. Yes, yeah, so yeah. it's possible that uh, Oakland, the conservatory could perform some of these pieces. That would be great. It would, in effect, it would be an alumni concert. Yeah. Right? because yeah. we're talking about yeah. a, a community of, of, of conservatory graduates. You know, the question of a you know, second performances of new works for orchestra is, you know, I'm waiting for somebody to crack that nut because okay. that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's a vexing problem in concert music. In general. It has, yeah. has yeah. been for a long time, right? It's yeah. very hard to get a second, for any almost anybody to get a second performance of an orchestra piece. Uh, Dr. Clark, have you had experiences, you know, in pieces that you, composers you've worked with, pieces you've commissioned, how do you approach the second performance? How do you try to get that off the ground? Well, interesting enough, um, there is a composer named Dr. Matthew Saunders, who I think he's at Lakeland Community <laughs> College. I, uh, from my chamber orchestra down in Worthington, Ohio, um, we commissioned him in 2015 for work. And Matt wrote me um, a few weeks ago um, and said, can you please write a rec recommendation for me? Because um, uh, there's an orchestra that um, is giving opportunities for the second performance of works that have been written and have never received the second performance. So um, he basically shared our audio from the concert. I wrote a recommendation um, about the for him uh, regarding the piece. So there, it, it seems there are people out there who thinks about this issue, which, you know, a lot of new music will get um, a first performance. And unless your name is one of the top names <laughs> in the industry, you sometimes are looked over. And there, I'm sure there's a lot of great works out there that have only gotten one performance. But yeah, this is, a, this is an issue. And, and recently I tried to help someone solve that. Um, um, you know, it's, it's really challenging. I know for myself, it's not that I wouldn't, well, I, I've had the pleasure of premiering a lot of works. There's only been one work that I've been able to do twice. And that by um, Joel Thompson, his elegy for or, uh, cello and orchestra. 
Um, but uh, definitely something that we should try to help composers with and find other resources like Matt found that there's an orchestra program out there that is trying to help. Um, I think also the issue with youth orchestra is that youth orchestra is a, is a different beast, if I could put it that way, because you have um, different iterations of the level of a youth orchestra. Right. Sure. Um, and, and what we have here, as you mentioned, Arlene, that this was Katya did so well to listen to our students, um, know what our instrumentation um, uh, was and 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 basically wrote a piece that will really work for us. Now that doesn't mean that Katya can expand on it and add more wind parts and what have you. But I think that youth orchestra, because of the level, um, a lot of people are afraid to go outside of these uh, works that are um, kind of watered down. You'll get the standard repertoire and then you'll get a, a rendition of a piece that's that's watered down and sometimes new music can be frightening for them, which I, is why I think it's so great that we have this as a part of our program. We're, you know, we're, we're making it work for our students, no matter the level of the ensemble each year. Um, but uh, I think that is the challenging thing. And I would love to help try to solve that within our own sphere or outside of it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't know, Colin, if there's some sort of a, you know, network of youth symphony directors and such that perhaps is a way to share some information there and get other youth orchestras interested. Um, you know, I know that Jeff has not only worked with Portland, with, but with some others. And so he has some contacts we might uh, leverage. And all of us may know other people in a similar situation. Um, you know, I also thought the, um, you know, our, our composers have gone on to distinguish themselves doing other things. I mean, one who comes to mind, and I sadly can't think of her name, but she's at Yale now. Um, oh, uh, Sue and Kim? Yes, yes, exactly. And I know I keep seeing things about what she's doing and hearing people praising her. And uh, she apparently is really making a name for herself. And so there may be a way in the places where these students go next, yeah. where they could reach out to the youth orchestras in those communities and see if they would be interested in playing a piece they had recently written for youth orchestra it would be enough and kind of build a, this might help build a network of all of the former composers in, in residence to share some ideas about how to get those works played and, and just share some, mm -hmm. you know, uh, networking. updates and networking about what they've been doing and, and uh, they might be actually helpful to each other uh, in the That's process. That's a great idea. Um, and, and I want to go back quickly back just to pick up on one thing you mentioned, which is worth noting here. It's a, a little bit orthogonal to this point, but the the um, uh, acceptance rate of Arlene and Larry Dunn composers in residence to like absolute top tier graduate yeah. programs in composition is really high. Oh. <laughs> it's like kind of amazing. To, I mean, I, I went to, you know, public school. So when I, when I, when I, I'm talking to a, a composer in residence about their plans and they say, yeah, I'm going to Princeton or Yale or Northwestern or somewhere. I'm yeah, always yeah. really impressed by that. And, and they, they all really succeed admirably in, you know, in their further schooling and then, and then beyond to the extent that I think they might all, they might just about all still be in, in uh, degree programs of one or another, one kind or another, given that uh, we're only, you know, five, six years. Uh, in yeah. 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 So. It's a little hard to believe that it is now six years. It seems like <laughs> we were just talking about this idea yesterday. So. Right, right. Um, can I ask one more uh, question to Katya, and then I'll open it up for uh, questions if you want to pose questions to one another, and then I think we'll probably call it. Katya, what are you working on now? What's your next project? Sure. Um, on my desk right now is an orchestra work for not a youth orchestra, but for the Oberlin Orchestra that okay. will really only be read um, next fall and whether or not it gets in a performance in front of an audience will be another story that will be more up to me but that is the the semester project for second year second semester and it's very very exciting I'm trying to look at it as an exciting thing and not a daunting thing though it's <laughs> certainly both um, and then so that that's sort of what's being composed right now and then the things that are closer to done, um, we have a midway concert 
coming up on February 25th, mm -hmm. in which I'll have a piece and in which I'll also be performing on the violin for other people's pieces. And then later in March, March 15th, I'll have another piece premiered um, for clarinet and percussion duo. Mm -hmm. So, so cool. little little guys. These programs yeah. that are coming up the midway concert, and that's being performed by whom? The midway concerts in general are happening right now. Um, the third year midway already happened. The second year midway, which is my class, will be happening on February twenty fifth, oh. two o'clock in Klonik Hall, and then the first years will be two weeks later than us, I believe, on March third perhaps? No, March 11th. Okay, do these get on the event calendar? Because I, I don't think we've seen anything like this. Um, I would be happy to send you the poster. Yeah, um, would you please? But yes, we, I think there will be an event, but we haven't put it out there yet. Uh, okay. These, these midway concerts are an opportunity for students to prepare an entire concert themselves without, uh, okay. without so, institutional help. And so, we're, so we're this does all not involve um, Tim Weiss or or no. the okay. Uh, yeah, actually, our, our faculty show up to, to see what we've done. Yeah, we went to a concert that, that sounds like this last semester that was in uh, Berenbaum that oh yeah was organized all by the composers and the players, and it wasn't. I don't recall them using the name Midway, but maybe right. maybe it was the fourth year's Midway concert or something. I don't know. That it was, was a very good concert. That was similar, but that was the it's called a departmental because there technically okay. there is still the assistance and support of the faculty. Gotcha. Whereas that midway is. is specifically so that we get experience finding all of our own players and rehearsing oh, it ourselves, well, conducting it ourselves, booking. Oh, that's fantastic. Booking. Yeah. But it, so um as a result, it might not get on the events calendar. Right. So um it should. It should, think, of course. Yeah. I think it can if you want it to, but somebody you just has need to, to tell get them. it get to Kathy <laughs> exactly. Strauss to Yeah, well that's uh that's exciting. Well very uh, exciting. Uh, if you send it to us, we'll uh um definitely put it on our calendar. Yeah. Our calendar is getting uh kind of full with a lot of co concerts of interest coming up. So yeah. um understandable. There's a lot of good stuff, but I will I will send happening. it to you. Which is why we moved here. So <laughs> I would like to make one little final comment. And that is that, um, so unfortunately, um, one of the things that added to our dismal few weeks is that my brother died last week. And um, we were in Boston and um, uh, and I saw my um, a nephew who follows us on Facebook and he was asking us, about the support that we provide for young people. Um, so it's the word is getting out about what we're doing beyond um, Oberlin. Um, and uh, that was nice that he acknowledged the, um, the work that, that we're doing to, um, to support young composers, so. That's wonderful to hear. It should be widely known. It's a big yeah. deal. Yeah. And we'd like we'd like it to be replicated in other youth orchestras. Exactly. If there's that's another thing to bring up at some future time right. for us to um, help help other youth orchestras um, develop new music programs. Yeah. Certainly, right, it was great I to actually have one you. one more comment too. Just <laughs> it, this is picking up on something that Katya said and something that Antoine said, um, which is really just getting back to the what we hoped would happen and it is such joy that it is and one is that that student composers uh who uh are craving to write for large ensembles get an opportunity to do so um when they're in the formative part of their career uh because large ensembles i know you know create all kinds of new um complexities and things that that are wonderful to learn about and work on and then from what Antoine said, um, the way that the that the uh, players have uh, uh, kind of received and embraced this piece, and I know there's been interesting and excited reactions to the others, and um, you know, providing the opportunity for young musicians to engage with music that's being written right this moment 
for them uh, is a really unusual experience, I think, and wonderful that our orchestra can provide this. And I think uh, it's gotta be great, you know, for all these kids, whether they go on in music or not, but I think the ones who do, this will probably be one of a kind of formative uh, experience for them as they think about what they're gonna do with music if they move on. I think you're exactly right. And I, can I add one little thing too? Sure, absolutely, yeah. I, I think Katya could, could probably um, agree with this, that as a composer, she has to deal with what's idiomatically possible for uh, an instrument. Um, but what's added to this is uh, understanding the level and um, what's possible for our students in making uh, that meaningful for them. Um, so it's not about watering down the technique, but finding solutions to making the drama and all those things come together. And she did a really good job on the outset. There were some things that, you know, I said, um, dovetailing between the first and seconds may not work as well here or the range on the clarinets. And she adjusted all those things and it seems so like perfect still. So um, I congratulate her on that. And I just think that's a worthwhile skill that we're giving these young composers. Yeah, we can't, we can't wait to hear it. Neither can I. <laughs> March 26th, uh, Sunday, March 26th, 6.30 PM in Finney Chapel. I am really looking forward to it. We all are. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much.